Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. We've gotten some great feedback on the seven-part series with Chris Rowe on turkey hunting western style, and I had a lot of fun with Chris. We're right in the middle of turkey season. Uh, I just got back from hunting in eastern Arizona on the White Mountain Apache Indian Reservation with a group of friends that we hunt with every year and had a great hunt up there, had a lot of fun. Uh, also, just got back last night from the Arizona Governor's Tag Goulds Turkey Hunt uh, with Mr. Donald Whitaker uh, and his wife Ginger, and uh, he was able to uh, complete his Royal Slam within the USA, meaning he got his Goulds Turkey in the U.S., and uh, he shot his uh, Goulds Turkey uh, down in southern Arizona uh, with his bow, and the the gobbler was actually standing on the back of my Dave Smith uh, Jake decoy and uh, was beating it up pretty good. And uh, Donald uh, was able to make a great shot at seven yards and um, harvested his first Gould's turkey. Uh, I believe that's his second slam with the, uh, let's see, second slam with the bow. I just had an awesome time uh, hunting. Uh, Gould's Turkey, and I'm looking forward to going to Mexico uh, to do the Gould's Turkey hunts down there. Got about uh, two and a half, three weeks of, of different hunts and hunters coming in uh, through Colburn and Scott Outfitters and uh, Gould's Turkey Hunt.com, and that's going to be exciting. Uh, guys, today's episode is going to be a great one with Robert Arrington of Deer Meat for Dinner. And Deer Meat for Dinner is a YouTube channel. It's one of the biggest hunting YouTube channels that there is. I believe he has over 175,000 subscribers. And uh, I got started watching uh, his YouTube channel and just uh, fell in love with uh, what he's doing and how he's doing it. Him and his wife, Sarah, uh, just had their first baby, Aria. And... Um, they just had her. She's a week old now, and I was able to interview uh, Robert before uh, the baby was born, and it was just exciting to hear how uh, excited he was uh, for the baby coming. And uh, we talk about alligators, we talk about bow hunting, we talk about whitetails, we talk about turkey hunting, uh, crabbing, uh, diving, fishing. Uh, he lives in Jupiter, Florida. And um, I want to encourage you to check out his uh, website at DeerMeatForDinner.com. His YouTube channel is Deer Meat for Dinner. Just search it on YouTube and also Deer Meat for Dinner on Facebook. Uh, everybody's excited here in Arizona because the Arizona elk and antelope draw uh, has not officially come out, but you can go on the Arizona Game and Fish website and sign in on the portal find out what you've drawn so everybody's in full frenzy mode here in arizona uh, i did not draw a tag here um, also reminder uh, uh, the nevada big game applications deadline is due here april 18th uh, also make sure to go on before you apply in nevada go on and check out the application strategies for nevada on gohunt.com insider also, Kansas deadline uh, is April 29th, so make sure you're thinking about Kansas and don't, don't forget about that. Uh, guys, I want to tell you about the GoHunt.com Insider Monthly Giveaway. Uh, this month, the month of April, uh, there, there will be uh, five insiders will win a Browning X-Bolt Hell's Canyon Speed Rifle. Uh, with a retail value of $6,350. Uh, all you have to do is be an insider member to win, to have a chance to win, excuse me. And uh, each month, uh, they, they give away great gear, great hunts. And um, if you're not a, an insider member, I encourage you to uh, go on GoHunt.com Insider. Use the J. Scott promo code. Uh, and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card when signing up. The Go Hunt Insider is 
by far the most valuable tool a Western hunter could give themselves. They are the industry leader and number one source for Western hunting for a lot of reasons. They have changed the game for how hunts and hunting information is found. Within a matter of minutes using the filtering 2.0, you will be able to filter by state, species, residency, odds of drawing, specific hunting dates, and harvest success percentages to find the hunts that fit exactly what you're looking for. If you're a guy that applies across the West or just in your home state but want to find out some new opportunities, there is no better way than to do it using GoHunt.com Insider. Make sure to use the J. Scott promo code when signing up and receive a $50 Kuyu gift card. Guys, this is going to be a great episode. Uh, for those of you that are out there busy turkey hunting, uh, I just encourage you to get out there early, stay there late and uh, give it your all and and number one important thing is just enjoy it have a good time a lot of times these turkey hunts are spending good times with family and friends and uh, i also want to thank you guys uh, my listeners here at the j scott outdoors podcast Uh, we had an unbelievable uh, month of march had over 224,000 downloads and I, I, I thank you guys specifically for that and for that support. Also, uh, every day I get comments uh, and emails uh, at my email, jscottoutdoors at gmail.com with questions, uh, comments, uh, with uh, things you want to see on the podcast. And uh, I appreciate every single one of those emails and I try and respond to them as quickly as I can. Uh, most of the time within a couple hours of getting those emails unless I'm on a hunt or off the grid somewhere. So uh, thank you for that support. I want to encourage you if this is your first uh, podcast uh, here at the J. Scott Outdoors podcast, um, I encourage you to subscribe. Uh, That way they will come on your uh, mobile device and um, every episode uh, will automatically come and you can listen to it. So guys, uh, you can follow along our adventures on Instagram at J. Scott Outdoors, my associate Dar Colburn at Dar Colburn. Uh, also, our mother website is jscottoutdoors.com, Colburn and Scott Outfitters.com, Gould's Turkey Hunt.com. And of course, our YouTube channel and our YouTube channel is growing uh, and I've been posting uh, quite a few videos and there's throughout this turkey season, we're going to be updating and uh, posting a lot of great turkey vocalizations and and a lot of different stuff on our YouTube channel. So go there and subscribe as well and uh, encourage you to go check out Robert Arrington at Deer Meat for Dinner on YouTube and subscribe to his channel. So let's get right to this episode and uh, thanks again. Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we've got a cool episode with Robert Arrington out of Jupiter, Florida and Robert owns and operates DeerMeatForDinner.com and DeerMeatForDinner on YouTube. And I was turned on to his YouTube channel by a friend of mine, Ryan Olson, with White Bone Creations. And uh, I started watching Robert's uh, videos here just a few days ago, and I found myself just watching, going back and looking through the archives. And uh, Robert, it's going to be awesome to have you on the podcast today. How are you doing? Man, I'm doing great. It's super nice to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the videos on your YouTube channel, quite honestly, are captivating. Uh, I live in the southwest deserts here in Arizona and get to do a lot of hunting and fishing. But you know, living that close to the water like you do and being able to, you know, run to the keys and, you know, go out and snorkel and, and free dive and, and uh, all of the, you know, hog hunting and, and, and different things. And not only that, I mean, you're hunting all over the, the, the country for deer. And But one of the things that I like most about the videos is, for one, how real they are, and two, uh, it seems like, you know, you're providing good value. Not only is it entertaining, but there's every single episode, whether it's, you know, how to how to prepare a meal uh, with your t- Tasty Tuesdays to, you know, this is how you um, fillet a fish. This is how you, you know, uh, work a brine. Um, and so there's a lot of value uh, in that YouTube channel. And 
I just wanted you to speak a little bit about, uh, you know, the way that you try and portray each video and how you're able to capture not only the entertainment value, but, uh, you know, the, the content that provides value by educating and helping people figure things out like you do it. Well, that's, man, you hit on so much right there. Uh, a good friend of mine, I've got to give him a shout out right off the bat, Greg Mutsanides, good old Moots, Lyman2323 on Facebook or on YouTube. He was always after me to start a YouTube channel. He's like, Rob, you live a really unique life. You do a lot. People will watch your videos, I promise. And I sort of took it as a joke for a while, and I had a, I had a TV show on Sportsman Channel called Respect Outdoors. Well, somewhere along the line, it became evident and evident to me that I wasn't going to make it on TV. TV was just, you know, just so much advertisement, so much money into it. And I was about telling stories and showing people the life that I live. And as I started the YouTube channel, I just wanted to show people really who I was. And that, you know, whenever you said, oh, your, your, your videos, videos seem real, that's like the best compliment you can give me because nothing is more important to me than people knowing who I really am and feeling like, hey, that video is real. There's no, you know, nonsense. They're not making things up. There's not a bunch of bogus cutaways. That's a real video, and they feel like they're really there with me. And sitting down, really trying to look at it, as I'm sure you do with your podcast. I said, you know, I came to the conclusion when people turn on the TV to watch any of the outdoor channels or any channel on TV, you're watching it to be entertained. You're watching it to sit there and relax, kick back, and be entertained. Very seldom do you turn on the TV going, I want to learn something. On the contrary, when people go to YouTube, nine times out of ten, they are there to learn something. I mean, kids these days... They use YouTube, they use Google as their number one avenue to figure things out. And so many kids and adults all across America, all across the world, they don't have a legacy. They didn't have a dad or a grandpa that took them out and showed them how to shoot a, a gun. Didn't, didn't teach them what a deer track looked like or how to hold a knife in their hand or how to skin a deer or haul a gate or whatever. They didn't have that. And they can't walk into a local sporting goods store and go, hey, I, I've never even been outside. I don't know what it's like to walk through the mud. I don't know what a deer track looks like. Can you guys teach me? That no one's going to do that. So what they do is they go to YouTube. And therefore, I wanted to be someone that they could trust, somebody that they could watch and appreciate and have a good time with, but all along learn a little bit. And so some videos are in the ocean. You know, I'm a captain on a big sport fishing boat. I love chasing blue marlins and broadbill swordfish and sailfish and all the other big plagics. But at the same time, I love going out to Lake Okeechobee and catching crappie, or as everyone else says, crappie. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's all about the pursuit. And with any of my videos, I want to show people what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and why I'm doing it. So... Uh, my friend William Kemble, he's a professional surfer and one of the most rad guys I've ever met. He always tells me, stick to the plot. Stick to the plot. Don't get off on any tangents. And that's what I try to do. I try to be real. There's not a bunch of graphics. I don't, very seldom do I even ever even say my name in the video. People know me because they've grown to love the channel, but very so I don't have big graphics. Robert Arrington, host, dear me for dinner. It's just... This is who we are, and this is the life that we live. And comments every single day, my wife and I get up and spend hours replying to comments. Because when people have a question, nothing is nothing bothers people worse than having an honest question and not getting the decency of a reply to that question. So we try to answer hundreds of comments a day. And um, it's really worked out great. We, we're so honored and so blessed and so thankful for each and every subscriber that we have and for all the wonderful support and encouragement that we get. You know, I think you, you hit something right there that is very key. And I know with my own podcast and, and such, uh, it's very important to me when I get email questions in and get texts, get 
you know, Facebook messages, whatever, um, in my opinion, responding immediately and right away is a huge priority for me because I feel like that person is taking the time to send me out of their day to send me a question or send me something, a comment or, or what have you. Uh, I think there's so many people in the industry, and I think that's why outdoor television, some, quote unquote, is so lame in a lot of cases in that they want to portray and, you know, put on this big show, but they're big time and they don't want to answer to the, the general public. They don't want to answer to their fellow hunters, their fellow fishermen their fellow sportsmen, and I think uh, you, you hit it right there. I think in order to provide value to people uh, that are your comrades, so to speak, uh, you, you have to give them uh, attention and you have to respond and you have to uh, you, you know, not do it once a week. You have to do it daily, and granted, we all have uh, busy lives, uh, but I think people see real quick who the fake fakers are and, and who the real deal is. And um, I can just tell by watching your videos um, that, you know, you guys just enjoy and love what you do. Uh, one of my other favorite things about the video, almost on every video, and especially the ones with the, the Tasty Tuesdays, the cooking ones, it always ends in a prayer. And, and I always like... Uh, people that are not afraid to show their faith and not not afraid to pray and I you can see that it's a real part of your life and I uh, just uh, commend you for doing that I'd like to back up a little bit here and ask you about like how you grew up and uh, where your love for the outdoors and hunting and fishing started and you know maybe walk me through some of some of the early years absolutely man uh, whenever I was a little kid, and I mean little, little, four or five years old, I had an older brother, Aubrey. I still have him. He's still my older brother, one of my favorite people in the world. And we have a very strong bond in our family. My mom and dad have been married since high school. Same way, uh, Sarah, my wife, her parents, they've been married since high school. And growing up, you know, whether it was using a dip net in the back ditch, catching crawdads and minnows and grass shrimp or jumping on my bicycle, riding over to the Loxhatchee River and waiting, uh, just throwing lures, mainly a red and white Zara spook. Uh, it just, it was always, I mean, I, I never wanted to sit inside and watch cartoons. I never had Legos. I never had toys like that. I, every single thing I ever asked for was a, I wanted a fishing pole. I wanted some new line, hooks, lures. Uh, bullets, I wanted a new BB gun, I wanted a shotgun, I always wanted something that I could use outside, and I can't even, I can't even go into any of this without mentioning whenever I was seven years old, you know, we lived in a rural area, and where, I, where did you grow up, Robert? Jupiter, Florida, off of Lock okay. River Road, and okay. at the time, there was nothing, now it's like a big, beautiful area full of manicured lawns, but at the time, it was nothing, it was just mud tracks. And um, I had an when ATC. You were seven. I had a I had a 110 Honda ATC, and I would go riding with all. And I I know, yeah, I was seven years old. But at seven years old, I knew right from wrong. I knew I mean I knew how to take care of my bike, and I rode everywhere. So I was out with all the kids riding, and I had one rule. That rule: do not cross Loxahatchee River Road, which was the only paved road. And we all rode up there, and every, you know I was with a bunch of kids that were like. 13 to 16, 17 years old. I was a little seven year old and they were going to go across that road. And they said, come on, let's go. And I'm like, no, I can't go across that road. Well, they said, okay, we'll go home. We're going. And when they all crossed the road, I remember thinking, heck, I ain't going home. I'm going with them. And I just took off and ran right out in front of a car and basically got just smashed. My left foot was ripped into my hip was destroyed. My face was destroyed. I mean, it was virtually worked as a fatality and um by the grace of god i lived and was in the hospital for months um just just i can't even get into all the details of that but they said i would never walk again all my thoughts of playing baseball and you know hiking and hunting and going the way i saw my life they said there's no way your foot we're going to try to save it but 
it, at best, it's going to be a stump. And by the time you're 14, we're going to have to amputate it. It's, you know, this doesn't look good. And about a month and a half, two months into my hospital stay, I just clearly remember praying, God, please, please, God, let me keep my foot. I need this foot. If I get to keep this foot, Lord, I will never stop going to church. I'll never, ever, ever deny who you are to me. And it gives me chills and brings tears to my eyes because that very day, my doctor walked into my hospital room and just in conversation, his name was Dr. Roni Sahayek. He put his foot on my, his hand on my foot and only thing you could really see were my toes, but I felt him touch my toes, which the thought of ever having feeling in my foot was so far removed from reality that that was never going to happen. So whenever he touched my foot and I felt it immediately, it was like, just the, it was like God stepped in the room and said, see, just trust me, you'll be fine. And, you know, amen, brother, to this day, my foot's work perfect, man. I can hinge it. I can move all my toes. I have a hundred percent feeling. And I've been to, to doctor, con- to medical conventions. All the doctors from top orthopedics all over the world have told me it's an absolute medical miracle, miracle that they can't, they cannot explain medically how my foot works and how I can feel it. And, um, last little piece of that, I said, doc, uh, I actually didn't tell him for about three or four weeks that I could feel what he was doing. And it was December 16th, 1983. I said, Doc, I said, um, we have a Christmas singing at our church this weekend, and I want to go to it. He said, Robert, um, you can't because on Monday you have a major operation. I said, well, if I show you something, will you at least let me go to that Christmas singing? He said, what are you going to show me? And I said, you touched my foot. And everywhere he touched my foot, I told him. And that Jewish man turned white as a ghost. And then I started <laughs> to hinge my foot. And I started to wiggle my toes. And immediately he arranged for me to get out of the hospital that day so I could go home for the Christmas singing. After the Christmas singing that night, I went home. And I remember mom saying, okay, one more minute. You can take one more sip out of the out of the shower. And the next morning I did, you know, because at midnight you can't drink or eat anything. The next morning I went in. Uh, I remember the big, long, white light above me going out. I remember waking up, and I can remember seeing my mom and my and my doctor over on the side of that waiting room, or the recovery room, and comes over and he says, uh, you're going to be going home. What we were going to do is already done. And from that very day, that very day, to this very day, I've never, ever been touched by a doctor ever again on my foot. So when people see me sitting at my at my kitchen table, thanking God for the day and that food. That ain't a show. That's real. That That's awesome is what that is. That's awesome. That is an incredible story. I, I can just hear how much reverence you have towards what happened to you, and that's commendable, and that's just an incredible story. And it puts the pieces of the puzzle together for me, seeing how real you are because you had, you know, you, you saw the side that could have gone really bad and, you know, you were, you were spared, your foot was spared. And, um, that's probably why you live life with so much vigor and so, you know, the way you do. And it's why those videos you're smiling and you're, you know, you're joking around and you're doing all your stuff. And, and, uh, that's awesome. Uh, at, from that day, and then once you got your foot back, I'm sure you learned also a good lesson that when your parents said, don't cross that road, you probably, that probably rang back in your head. And, um, there's probably a lot of things you have done in your life where you've decided not to do it because, you know, that one time. Absolutely, man. I've, uh, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of public speaking. I love talking with kids. Uh, middle school and high school are really my favorite. But decision making, I always ask kids whenever I go to these schools. It's funny, I was actually a keynote speaker at uh, the National Honor Society one time, and I never made the honor. I never made the honor roll in my life. So, <laughs> but um, I would always ask them. I say, "Hey, who knows where you're going to be in five years?" And then you know, you get like ten, fifteen percent of the hands. And then I say, "Yeah, it's a tough question. Who knows where you're going to be in one year?" 
And then you get like 95% of the hands. And as they all start going up, I say, you know what, you guys, put your hands down because in all honesty, you're all wrong. I said, but I can tell you right now where you will be tomorrow in a year at the end of your life. I can tell you where you're going to be. You're going to be where your decisions take you. I said, everybody has decisions to make. When you make the proper, the right decision, you go in the right direction. It doesn't mean you're not going to have pitfalls and you're going to have things that out of your control happen. I was like, but when you honestly take the time to make the right decision, you go down the right road. And don't worry about where you're going to be in a year. Don't worry about where you're going to be in 20 years or five years. Worry about where you are today and the what you have to do today. What do you have to do? You have to get up, work, put your right foot in front of your left. And do what's right today, and I guarantee you it will put you in the position to do that again tomorrow. And when you make a habit of doing that in your life, you will find that the world opens up to you and opportunities are all around you because people want to be around people that live like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's take a quick break here. Cool. Utah Hydrographics is in the water transfer printing service and they are open to whatever you can dream up. Choose from a wide range of camel patterns, designs, and colors. Whether it's guns, bows, tools, rifle stocks, vehicles, steering wheels, fenders, dashboards, paint guns, fishing rods, cups, tripods, watches, knife grips, helmets for a local sports team or for your motorcycle, picture frames, mailbox, animal skulls, you name it, they can probably do it. Utah Hydrographics loves taking things that are general looking and turns them into something that looks fantastic and eye-popping. Give them a call and see what they can do for you and receive up to a 10% discount by using the J. Scott 16 promo code. Visit them at utahhydrographics.com or on Instagram at Utah Hydrographics. Whether you are interested in elk, deer, antelope, bighorn sheep, or moose, Western Hunter and Elk Hunter magazines will bring the adventure to your mailbox. These publications feature articles on the finest hunting gear, tips and tactics from experienced hunters, field judging trophies, glassing techniques, calling strategies, and much more. To become a more knowledgeable and skilled hunter, subscribe today. Go to westernhunter.net forward slash jscott and enter your email address for a chance to win a $1,500 credit towards any Swarovski product. Robert, where did you get... Do you go by Rob or Robert? Robert. Okay. Robert, where did you get the opportunity to be a captain on a sport fishing boat? I mean, at some point in time, you had to progress enough as a as a sportsman, as a fisherman, for someone to say, I want that guy running my boat. Yeah, that's so funny, man. This is some cool stuff here. So go back to being a little kid. I'm, work, I'm on the docks right there, Zeke's Marina. Uh, basically, the docks where the square grouper is now, if any of your, any of your uh, viewers have ever been there, know where that is. That was nothing. I'd just be fishing, throwing my lures, and you would see these sport fishing boats at the time, like a 37 Merit called the Deuceday going. And I would say to myself, man, how does someone get on a boat like that? And then through high school, uh, went and I became a mate on a boat. And then I, I actually bought the tender to that boat, which was a 27 foot Rambo. And I started, gui- I went and got my captain's license and I started guiding light tackle inshore, you know, like, near shore, catching sailfish, dolphin, wahoo, um, snappers, groupers, stuff like that. And then I started broadbill sword fishing a lot, you know, early, back in like uh, 99, 2000, when it was very, very rare for anyone to ever do that. And I got asked to be a mate on a big sport fishing boat. And I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll do it. So I went, we were blue marlin fishing in the Bahamas. And unfortunately, the captain got in trouble with some substance and got fired. And the owner of the boat said to me, uh, Rob, do you know anyone who could apply for this position? I said, absolutely. I said, I got a buddy of mine's uh, resume downstairs, run down, grab my captain's license, walk back and handed it to him. And he goes, can you, can you run this boat? I said, uh, sir, this boat floats and has motors. I can run it. And he, I was 24 at the time. He said, uh, well, let's go for a sea trial. So I said, look, let me go through the safety gear. Let me look at the boat, figure things out. 
In all honesty, I had to figure out how to turn it on. I swear to God. (laughs) I turned it on, got the throttles engaged and started bumping it around in the, in the slip. And, you know, a big sport fishing boat runs on twin diesel engines. And my dad growing, my dad still has a bobcat business, which is a skid steer. You know, you're driving with your left and right hand, essentially with a sport fishing boat when you're in tight quarters, that's which straighten your rudders and run the boat with your props. So I said a quick little prayer and we pulled out of the slip, went around, made me do all kinds of figure eights and back and down and spin around, put it back in the slip, shook my hand, said, uh, congratulations, you're my new captain. <laughs> How soon can you be in New Jersey? I said, well, as soon as you want me there. And uh, I've ran the boat all over. I've, I mean, that was a 56 foot ocean. Now we have a 63 foot custom Carolina boat. I've ran it all over. I mean, all over the world. We've had it all up and down the eastern seaboard, throughout the Caribbean, through the Panama Canal, up and down the Pacific. And um, that's great. But Same owner? I love that. I love that. But I'm not a rich man. That running sport fishing boats is a rich man's game. I love being around people that I really relate with. And um, I love everything that has to do with the outdoors. Therefore, one situation feeds the next. You know, yeah, for sure. And and um, is that same owner? Are you? Is that still the boat you're running now? Correct. The same. I've only owner? ever worked for one owner my whole life. And is that boat uh, primarily uh, stationed right there in Jupiter, close to you? Yes, sir. We do. We you know we take it on trips here and there. We're getting ready to go fish a tournament in Cuba, and then we'll probably do trips down. Maybe this year we're probably going to skip the Dominican Republic, but we do a lot of trips in the Bahamas, and we'll probably run up and fish North Carolina. And uh, he knows that he, he he's not one of those owners that likes to fish all the time. He knows, I mean, he and I have a very good relationship, and so he lets me do my thing, and then whenever we get together, we fish, we have a good time, and it's all good. It's not your typical captain-boss relationship. I, I watched a video of you and Sarah, your wife, who is pregnant and going to have baby Aria here within a, within a matter of days. Maybe today, you know, you, maybe today. right during the interview, you might get Sarah <laughs> might be saying, let's go. Yeah, I'm going to um, sure if that happens. I watched a video and you guys ran, it looked like about 57 miles out to the Bahamas and uh, you were catching these fish on a reel setup that was electric. Yep. So they're like 800 feet deep and... Tell me about that. That was awesome. Yeah, that's really a cool deal. Uh, we run over the Bahamas. I stay at a place called Old Bahama Bay. They're on West End of Grand Bahama Island. And, you know, it's great snorkeling. We can go spearfish for groupers and hogfish and snappers. But I really love to deep drop. And so you're fishing anywhere from 600 to 1,500 feet of water. And you just cannot use hand crank. You would kill yourself just reeling your lead up and down, most less the fish. Well, because it's so deep, there's so much area, and it's virtually wide open. You know, the fishing is just amazing. And I make all my own rigs, and squid is my favorite bait. And you're using the boat and your bottom machine and your chart plotter. So your chart plotter is telling you areas that I've fished before and caught fish. Then I'm using my bottom machine trying to mark fish on the bottom, and then either me or Sarah will drop it down. Once you hit bottom, you're trying to keep that that lead on the bottom. Whenever you start feeling the hits, bubble, 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 you'll hook the fish. And a lot of times, you know, we'll have contests. You know, that typically we'll have anywhere from three to six hooks on the rig, and we'll see who can catch the most fish and uh, throw them on ice and talk about good to eat. Boy, it's amazing. Yeah, I noticed you. So what were those fish that you were bringing up? Uh, they were kind of a reddish orange. Oh, color. yeah. Yellow eye snapper. Talk about yellow them. eye snapper. We really catch the most of them in about seven to nine hundred feet of water. Snow white meat. They're just, oh, my gosh. Talk about white, flaky, just beautifully succulent meat to eat. Do you guys eat fish? I mean, every day, either either wild game or fish. Pretty much. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, I'm not against going to the store and picking up some ribs, uh, and I'm not above going and getting some steak. But I like to eat estate grown steak. Like my friends up in Iowa, 
Circle K cattle, the Marlin and Brenda Courthouse. They raise cattle. I like to buy beef from them because I know where that beef came from. I know I like to know where my food came from. I like to know who processed it. Um, but to me, I eat fresh fish. I mean, one out of a hundred times, one out of a thousand times will I eat frozen fish. I typically go out. I keep enough for me and my family to eat. I let everything else go and come home, clean it up. You know, I keep, typically if you catch a fresh fish, you can keep those fillets in the fridge for five to seven days, no problem. So you'll, you know, if you catch a good mess, you're going to have three or four fish dinners out of that. And then by the time you're done with that, then you're ready to go eat a bunch of deer meat or wild hog or turkey or dove or duck or whatever, you know? So it's always mixing it up. Tell me about the video that I watched where you were going down free diving and you were pulled that grouper out from under, it looked like a bunch of coral, and you were wrestling with it, and you finally got that sucker up. And uh, I can't believe you held your breath that long. First of all, eh, you know it's just what I do. I mean, look at you. you you're you're an unbelievable big game guide out there. You could you could show me things out there that I have no idea on. Since I was a little kid, going back to my foot, swimming has always been my therapy. And so as a kid, I'm a, I'm a driven person. So no matter how deep the water was, I had to figure out how to swim down that deep. And then I just started really exercising my lungs. I try to stay in shape and free diving. I learned a lot of technique. Manny Puig down in the Keys back before the uh, jackass days, uh, he, <laughs> he taught me a lot about free diving and, and mechanics, how to really line your body up and how to properly weight yourself. Um, and so... I just work on it, work on it, work on it. And whenever I'm in the water, that is my absolute happy place. I just feel as free and as happy as you can imagine. And so once I'm after a fish, it's like a bulldog on a bone. It's me versus you, and <laughs> I'm going to do whatever I can to get you in the boat. Yeah, it was, it's a great video. Guys, got to go check that out for sure. And, Robert, you also do a ton of hunting. Uh, tell me about pr predominantly what you guys hunt for throughout the year in different seasons and traveling around and, you know, kind of what are you hunting most and and uh, your, kind of your, what you do. Well, I'd say my, my two specialties are white-tailed deer and alligators. My wife and I guide a ton of alligators. We take people from all over the country. Heck, we've got people from India trying to book a gator hunt with us right now. But if you really wanted to know my, my true specialty, it is alligator hunting. Now, I've killed a lot of big whitetails, but I don't live in the Midwest. I live in South Florida. So, I mean, I feel like if there's a 12-foot alligator in a pond, I feel like I can catch that gator every single time. And that's not easy to do. And so I, I mean, I think about alligators more than you can imagine. And, uh, but along with that, we do a lot of hog hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting. We have the Osceola turkeys here. I might go turkey hunting in the morning, to tell you the truth. Uh, dove hunting, duck hunting, quail. Um, tell me about this alligator, uh, hunting. Uh, I was really fascinated with the swamp people show. Um, as, as you know, the whole, the whole world right. was, um, tell me about alligator hunting. Are, are you catching them with, you know, I saw one video where you were catching them with uh, a rod and reel. Right. You, you were shooting them with bows, shooting them with guns. Walk me through that. That sounds pretty cool. Okay. So let's get the gun out of the situation. The only time I'll ever use a gun on an alligator is if I'm on a, on a private piece of property and we have deprivation permits where we, they say, okay, here's 50 tags. You can go kill 50 50 alligators on this property, I'll take, you know, we can go out with a 22 Hornet or, you know, 22 Magnum or whatever, and we can shoot our gators that way. But whenever I'm guiding, I'm guiding during the public season and public waters with state-issued CITES tags. Now, there's several ways we can get those gators. I can use an unhooked bait. So I can use a bait with a two-inch peg of wood and set that bait, and it's got to be attached to my boat. So I use a rod and reel with that bait. When the gator eats it, you use the line as an indicator of where the gator's going, and then try to get a hook or a harpoon dart into the gator. Now, 
I've caught a lot of big gators that way. A lot of gators that you can't catch any other way, I have got on bait. But one of my favorite ways is to is to stalk a gator with a crossbow or a bow and arrow, and your arrow has a dart attached to a line, and then that line is attached to a float. Once you get that dart into the gator, it's like battle royal. I mean, humongous. <laughs> You don't understand how much power these giant alligators have. And so is it a wire? Is it a wire or no, is it it's heavy amount of filament or braided or what is it? Five hundred pound test braided line, and then you have a cable. Oh, yeah. You have a cable uh, leader so that when the gator's scratching at it, he doesn't you know cut your line. And then you know we oh. sometimes we'll run them down and harpoon them off the front of the boat. Um, and then the most common way that I catch gators because it's the most fun for my clients is Sarah will run the boat and Sarah is such a hardcore gator hunter. It's not even funny. She's got eyes like a hawk and she really has a heart for gator. I couldn't do what I do without Sarah, but I'll be on the front of the boat. Me and the client will take a spinning rod with 80 pound braid, get the gator hooked. And then you're basically fighting a three to 800 pound animal on a spinning rod until you can get close enough <laughs> to get a dart into them. It, it is, it's so amazing. Like imagine taking one of your clients on a hunt, whether with a, with a bow and arrow or with a gun, when that animal walks out and you drop the crosshairs or put that pin, boom. Hey, as long as it was a good shot, all we have to do now is blood trail it and take care of our game with a gator. Once you make the shot or once you get them hooked up, boy, the fun has just begun, and it is so intense. I mean, you should see the holes taken out of the side of my boat. These gators <laughs> bite the boat so hard, it'll shake my 24-foot Carolina skiff. And wow. it's just an intense – I've taken so many hunters that have hunted Africa and hunted all over the world – and at the end of it, they're sh visibly shaking and saying, that was the most intense hunt I've ever been a part of in my whole life. And to me, that's the, you know, I took it. Last year, I took an a insurance guy. We're coming back. It was his birthday. He caught an 11-6. We're running back. And he goes, you know what? You have the best life in the world. He goes, because every one of your clients is happy to be here and happier when they leave. He goes, my clients hate paying me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Let's take a, another quick break here. Cool. Have you guys heard about PhoneScope? PhoneScope is a privately held company that makes custom molded, precisely engineered smartphone digiscoping adapters. Photographing wildlife has never been easier. Take digiscoping photos and videos from your smartphone and share them with your friends. PhoneScope stands behind their product with a hundred percent money back guarantee. PhoneScope is the future of digiscoping. Get yours now. Use the JSCOT16 promo code and receive 10% discount on all purchases. Check them out at PhoneScope, that's P-H-O-N-E-S-K-O-P-E dot -E com, or on Instagram, at PhoneScope. Wilderness Athlete is committed to improving the health and quality of life for the outdoor athlete by providing field-tested, scientifically validated nutrition and sports performance products. Check them out at wildernessathlete.com and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off any order. Since 1982, the Outdoorsman's in Phoenix has made it their goal to provide the very best customer service combined with the latest and greatest optics and accessories in the business. Outdoorsman's is the leading designer and manufacturer of high-quality tripods and mounting accessories for any hunter's optical needs. Go to Outdoorsman's.com or call 1-800-291-291. 8065 and use the J. Scott promo code to receive 10% off all Outdoorsman's packs and pack accessories. Robert, these gators, so when you get them up close, I mean, what do you do? You shoot them with a 22 in the head? No, you, no, no. Do you beat them over the head with a with a bat? I no, mean, how I, are do you? Is, uh, I, I turn Sarah loose. She puts them in headlock and beats them into submissions. I can see that. I can see that. <laughs> No, we. Uh, I use a Gator Pro bang stick. Gator Pro is a, a local company around here. Jeff Lacera machines all the equipment. He makes all my harpoons. He makes all of my bang sticks. 
and snares and whatnot. A lot of times when the gator gets up, I'll snare him around the top jaw just so I can control the top of his head. And then you use what's called a bang stick and you bust them right behind the hard plate on their head back in the soft. You're, what you're doing is you're trying to go back and uh, bust through the spinal column or into the brain and, uh, and it kills the gator absolutely instantly. Stone dead. Tell me about these gators. I mean, are they just, are they everywhere? You know, uh, the, there's a perception out there that, you know, there's not many gators or what have you, you know, and that's someone talking from the Southwest, but I know that's not the truth. What, what's the real scoop with the gators in Florida? There are, okay, A, number one, gators grow three to four times faster than what people thought. People were like, oh, that 12-foot gator, he's about 75 to 100 years old. That's such a that's such a myth. It's not even funny. University of Florida has done intense studies on wild alligators throughout the southeastern United States, and it's fairly it's it's known that a 12 foot gator gets to that size in about 14 years. Now, granted, it's not like a four or five year old white tailed deer getting to maturity, but that gator is going to reach his maximum maximum length in about 14 years. From there, he'll just put on size, put on girth. And um, alligators are everywhere. Sow gators, a female gator, we call them sows, they're vigilant mothers. Once they build their nest and those little bitties hatch out, they will just protect them through thick and thin. Lots of them live through. And once they, once they live, they're going to grow a foot or more every single year. And uh, they eat constantly. And look, I mean, heck, a gator will. I've I've had several dogs get killed. Everyone around here, if you if you live growing up hog hunting with your dogs or deer hunting with your dogs, gators will snatch your dog up so fast it's not even funny. And it's like anything else. I mean, look at the problem wolves are presenting out west. Yeah, it's like our coyotes yeah, out here. Your coyotes. They're just everywhere. Yeah. But if you don't manage your natural resources. They're going to manage you, and that just that's not how it happens. That's, you've got to take care of them. If we did not have the gator program that we do here in Florida, gators would be absolutely ev- – they would be in everybody's swimming pool. It would, be a, it would be a nightmare. How does someone go on a gator hunt with you, contact you through your website? Yeah, just shoot me an email at robert at deermeatfordinner.com. And if you live in Florida, I'll help you get the tags in your name. Or if you live out of state, I can get the tags in your name. But probably about 75% of the time, I apply for tags for, like, my mom and my dad and me and Sarah and several other kids, you know, younger guys. I'll buy the tags, and as long as that tag holder rides along with us, then I will get my client what's called an alligator trapping agent license so they can legally harvest the tag holder's gator. It's 100% legal. It's People do it everywhere. It's, I mean, it's known. That's what happens. And uh, that's why they put the alligator trapping agent program in place. And uh, so we put it together. I Every hunt that I take you on, I guarantee people a gator over 8 feet long. Although the last two years we've averaged 10 feet. And What's the biggest gator you've ever gotten? That, that's a unique question. I was hunting with a guy named Lee Lightsey years ago. We caught an 11.8. That was the biggest bodied gator. I've never seen a bigger body gator. That gator, he was remarkably huge. But last year I caught a 12.8 and a half and three years I caught a 12.8. Both of those gators were massive. I've caught numerous gators over 12, but these two 12.8s were just phenomenally big. Just huge body. Have you ever gone anywhere else to hunt gators, like other states, um, Louisiana or any of these other states, or is Alabama, Florida? Just- I hunted during the first, Al- the very first Alabama season. I hunted there uh, on the Dallas County and Wilcox County line. Uh, I didn't know the area real well. I was hunting a little creek and near the people's camp. We caught a nice gator, but unbeknownst to me, in the big Alabama River, there were just a lot of. If I if there was any alligator hunt I could ever redo, it would be that hunt because I would have left that creek immediately and been out the out in the big river where there were just jump. That's where they caught that big fifteen footer not long ago. Wow. Yeah, um, is it true if you get bit by an alligator that there's more bacteria and what have you in their in their bite than 
I mean, you're are you dead on your feet or? Well, you're not dead on your feet, but I guarantee you, you don't want to get bit by them. I always tell every client that gets on my boat, here's the deal: whatever that gator, but whatever he bites, he owns. So if he bites your <laughs> hand, he owns it. He's gonna take it with him. He ain't giving it back. They have so much jaw pressure. Not to mention, they can grab it and just like corkscrew and spin and they are not, it is amazing how much power they have in their mouth yeah they're they're unbelievable animals um shifting gears here wh when you started your youtube channel was it an instant success or did it take some time that's kind of the first question and then if if it if it wasn't a complete instant success you know, how did you just gain all kinds of momentum? I think you got 170,000 subscribers on your channel. Yeah, it's only a couple of years. Well, we're going on three years now. But this is what happened. I had my show on Sportsman Channel, and I literally went so – I went as broke as the Ten Commandments. I was smashed. I had no money left. And I remember saying a uh, high school coach of mine, Coach Primus, love that guy. I was always a smaller kid, and I'd be like, Coach, I can't block this guy. And he'd say, Anton, keep moving your feet, boy. Keep moving your feet. And that's turned into like a philosophy of mine in life. Keep moving my feet. So I'm broke. My show is now off air. I'm getting sued for airtime fees. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm sitting there at my kitchen in my, uh, in my condo cooking deer meat. And I say, okay, Rob, what – do you truly love in this world? Because to make it, you got to get back to the fundamentals. You got to get back to the basics. And you got to keep moving your feet. And as a, I'm a very joking guy, I, I'm constantly cracking with people. I look at my pan of fried deer meat and I go, I love deer meat. And I'm like, I like deer meat for dinner because I was cooking deer meat for dinner. I'm like, deer meat for dinner. Holy crap. I'm like, that could be a website. So I run in my, run in my room and I, I use my phone as a hotspot. I'm on because I didn't even have money for Wi-Fi. I go on to GoDaddy and DeerMeatForDinner.com was available. So I'm like, honey, I was like, do you have a credit card that has like ten dollars free money on it? She's like, uh, yeah, we have, we can do it. So I buy it. <clears throat> that night, I just I had shot a video while in Kansas deer hunting of cooking some deer meat, and I did I made that video and put it on, and then I started a Facebook channel, and. <laughs> Facebook channel started to rock and we started to get a few views and our rent at the time was a thousand bucks a month. Well, I made four or five videos in the span of just a very little while. And one of them was cooking alligator tail with Everglades seasoning. And I'll make a, uh, I'll make a proclamation right now that nobody on my entire channel has ever heard. No one's ever heard this. So if any of my subscribers hear this, you will know. I grew up eating Everglades seasoning. Everyone around here eats Everglades seasoning. And I started using that Everglades seasoning. Well, they invited me out to their office. I had like 800 subscribers. And it was wonderful. I got to meet Mr. Chris and Kelly and everybody. And he said, Rob, he goes, I love that video you did. He goes, what would it cost me for you to use Everglades in all your videos? And I'm thinking in my head, heck, just give me some seasoning. I'll be happy. But <laughs> I was thinking of my $1,000 rent payment. I'm like, Mr. Chris, I said, if you give me $1,000 a month, I'll use Everglades for here on out. And he goes, I'll write you a check right now. And I literally almost fainted because I'm like, <laughs> this is not real. He wrote me a check. He's ne they never asked. They don't tell me, ask me nothing. Now, I went from 800 subscribers to 170,000. I mean, we'll pick up 800 subscribers in the next two or three days. But I never raised the rate on him. He keeps sending me a check. I keep using Everglades seasoning. And it's so all my subscribers out there, now you know the truth or the, the full story behind Everglades seasoning. I Everyone who's ever bought it due to my channel know how amazing of a seasoning it is. But what means so much to me is those are real people. Those are real people that care and that are real and honest. And I love the fact that they stepped up. We weren't worth near $1,000 a month. Now we're worth right. far more than that. But you know what? A deal's a deal. And I'm so honored that they helped me out in that time. And then we started you know, doing skinning videos, skinning hogs and deer and gators. 
with my silver stag knife. I've been using silver stag knives for a long, long time. And uh, Brad Smith, the owner of silver stag reached out to us and said, Hey, let's create your line of knives. And now we make royalties on those knives and we're making really good money on our Google AdSense. And all we did was we kept putting one foot in front of the other. We kept being real at first. I mean, our success was very, very slow, but I could see the light at the end of the tunnel. I knew if I keep doing this, all I got to do is get one more subscriber, another subscriber, another subscriber. And then it started turning into, you know, 25, 30 a day. Then it got to 75 or 100 a day and then 200. Now full three, four, 500 a day. And we never divert from our plot. We are who we are. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's like my secret to success is being real. There's nothing fake, so I don't have anything to hide. Yeah, you know, I think that's the secret to success uh, for sure. You know, with my own podcast here, I was just looking back this morning. I uh, started uh, not this last February, but the February before was at the end of February when I launched it. And I was looking at March uh, download numbers uh, last would, would be last March. Uh, it was 21,000 downloads for the month. And at the time, uh, Robert, when I started it at the end of February, when I got done with my first month, I thought 21,000 downloads. That's unbelievable. <laughs> right. And then, and then I go and just look at um, I was looking at yesterday. I was looking at the um, numbers and, you know, 220,000 downloads for the month of March alone. So 10 times growth in one year. And um, you know, I attribute it to, uh, you know, tr trying to provide uh, valuable content and being real and answering people that email. And, uh, you know, my grandfather always told me he'd say he'd he, I'd go with him. He was a cattle buyer and a rancher. And he'd say I had a little kid and he'd say, OK, we're going to go in here. and We're going to meet some men. He says, I want you to. And I'm little. He says, I want you to shake their hand. I want you to shake it as hard as you can. And I want you to look them in the eye and say, nice to meet you, sir. And he basically made it known that if he ever saw me not acknowledge someone and shake their hand and look them in the eye and, you know, in other words, give them the time of day and let them know that, you know, you're a real person and, you know, be respectful. You know, I knew that I was in for, you know, a, a, a rude awakening if you ever saw me not do that. And, you know, I think by the way you're doing things and being real, on, I mean, all someone has to do is watch your videos one video one time and they will know they, they'll feel like they know you. And that's like watching your videos. I feel like I could just show up there tomorrow, knock on the door. Hey, I'm here. And you'd be like, hey, bud, we're going to do this today. We're going to do that. And it's like, you know. And I think that is the key to being successful uh, is provide value, but be yourself and be real. And uh, you guys have done a phenomenal job at that. I, I, I want to ask you um, about Sarah and um, she's an integral part of your channel and and obviously, uh, you know, your life um, did Sarah have a background in hunting and fishing or, uh, you know, did she come along and just progress uh, along with you for each adventure or how did all that work? A little of both. Sarah lived in Wisconsin, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and four years ago, she sent me a friend request on Facebook. I was like, wow, she was look, this beautiful blonde holding like a 48 pound carp in one arm up against her body. I'm like, well, I've got to accept, accept this. And so yeah. this is a, this is a no brainer. Yeah, this is like a for sure. Can I click yes twice? <laughs> so I shoot her and I shoot her a message. We start talking and then instantly I had to go to Iowa to go to my friend's farm to check on some tree stands. You know, I had to do that. So she picked me up in Madison, Wisconsin. We drove over to the farm and spent a few days together and we decided right then, Hey, this is something that's going to work. And uh, to, she quit all her jobs. She had just graduated college and was working at a big dentist office and working at Shields. She quit all her jobs, flew to Dallas, Texas. I picked her up there, and we've been together ever since. And she grew up hunting. Her mom and dad have like 30, 40 acres or 60 acres. I don't remember. Smaller farm in Wisconsin where the rule is if it's brown, it's down. And, yep. 
If it hops, it drops. If it flies, it dies. That's it. You know, she she was really <laughs> never into trophy hunting. She had never had the opportunity to hunt bigger white tails. And at the time, I was doing my TV show, so I was really focused on big mature deer. And we started spending time together and traveling around hunting, having a great time. She actually killed a really nice one in Oklahoma with us and came home. She moved in. And we, you know, I know that sounds weird. She moved right in. She moved from Wisconsin down south. And I mean, she had never seen the ocean before. She became a fish. And she, yes, she was a hunter and fisherman before, but she's learned so much. She's just a push. Everyone that meets her knows she's like a sponge. She wants to learn. She loves being a part of everything, whether you're taking an engine apart or whether you're putting together daytime sword fishing rigs or whether you're getting ready to go alligator hunting, she's got to be a part of everything. And she's really, really, really an amazing chick. Yeah. You can just tell by watching the video. She's, she's awesome. And it's going to be exciting to see both of you as parents and uh, get to raise Aria in the sporting life. And uh, it won't be long and Aria will be following you along, you know, helping you with your rigs and, oh, yeah. you know, and messing with the alligators and all that, all that stuff. And, and that's just awesome. Um, what, what season, obviously it's Turkey season right now. Um, and you've got Osceola's what is coming up, you know, in the next month, next two that you're looking for both on the fishing front, uh, and, and on the hunting front, what's, what's coming into season and what are you looking forward to? Well, we're right here in the middle of Turkey season. I'll probably, hunt one more turkey. I haven't killed one yet. I could have, but uh, I'm probably going, I've got a piece of property. I'm going to go turkey hunting on. And then I'm taking over a new lease in April. It's 3000 acres just up the road from me. And I'll do a lot of hog hunting on that. I'll take a lot of people, a lot of kids in the area, subscribers and whatnot. Someone who's never got to hunt. I'll take them out and let them hog hunt. And then I save those hog lungs for gator baits and you know, make sausage and give the kids a bunch of wild hog meat to take home with them. And uh, then the spring and summer is big time blue marlin and daytime sword fishing time for me. So I fish a lot in the spring and summer. Then as you come out of summer, gator season starts August 15th. And so the month from August 15th to September 15th, I'm either sleeping, taking care of an alligator, or killing an alligator. That's like what that month. And then as soon as I get out of that, then you're into the fall where – Hopefully, I get to go on an elk hunt somewhere, antelope hunt, or deer hunt, and then come back. As the fall dwindles down, then December, we really start sail fishing a lot. December, we sail fish. January, February, we sail fish. Then you're back into March where you're getting ready for Blue Marlins again. And it's just a, it's a fun life. You know, we love it. It's always something new, and you're always, you know, got the hammer down, going as hard as you can. That's right. That's awesome. How are the dogs doing? Oh boy, the dogs are awesome. Marmar, Remy, and, and uh, Tebow, they're they're just part of our family. They they have so much fun and they're all healthy and happy and you can tell they know mama's pregnant and so you know they're they're ready to go at all times. The, it's pretty fun to watch the videos and watch uh, how the lab um, kind of a little more mellow, kind of, and the other two are running around and, and just, just, uh, love the interaction, um, with that. I, I want to conclude the interview here with questions about cooking. Have, have you always been a good cook? One. And, uh, if you haven't, you know, how did your cooking progress? <laughs> okay. Really good story. Uh, growing up, I was probably nine, eight or nine years old. Dad, we always had deer meat in the refrigerator. And my mom was off on some trip showing rabbits. And my dad, I love my dad, old Walt, he says, hey, boy, get in there and cook some deer meat. I'm like, wait, how the hell do you cook deer meat? He's like, I don't know. Go figure it out. I'm like, okay. I walked in there. Who knows what I did? But I remember trying to fry up some deer meat. I'd always watch mom fry deer meat. So I get it made up and. From then, I'd always, I'd ask my mom, how you do this, how you do that, and I'd start doing different things. Um, in my teens and early 20s, I worked at a really nice restaurant as a waiter, and I would see these amazing dishes, and I would say, if someone can make that, I can make that. i got to figure out how to make that. And a buddy of mine, Josh Henderson, he showed me a few little things, just little ideas, and then I would work on this and work on that, and 
I always had fresh fish, lobster, wild game. I always had ingredients to work with. So I'd constantly work and try, and then you develop your own little, you know, your own little tendencies and your own little style. And then people would always want to come over. Like anytime I was cooking at my house, everyone would always call it the Rob Shack, going over to the Rob Shack to eat. And so as the channel started, Jeremy for dinner, um, it just fell into place. I always cooked, you know, from young, I would always cook, you know, for whoever, you know, anyone, I, yeah, everybody's house in Florida that I've ever visited, I cook everywhere. And so just not a chef, I'm not a chef. I have no training whatsoever. I just, I just figure little things out. It's like an artist. Give somebody a bunch of paint, a paintbrush. If they're an artist, they can use what paint they've got and make what they think they see in their head. And that's kind of what I do. Yeah, it's awesome. I love watching the videos and learning. My wife, I got my wife watching. She loves cooking wild game. And, um, you, you know, it's funny. She's like, what's this Everglades seasoning? <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. And she was and she, off. It was the other night and she off she went in the other room to go find her iPad. She was going to look up this Everglades seasoning. And, and um, you know, she's like, what is this Everglades seasoning? Um, that's awesome stuff. And the meals you cook are, are great. And I know people... Uh, that are listening here on the show. Uh, if, if you like cooking at all and you like cooking fish and wild game, uh, Robert has all kinds of incredible little recipes and little tricks of the trade and preparing and, and what have you. And uh, just an awesome channel. Uh, Robert, how can people find you um, and how do they find your channel? And I want to encourage them to subscribe once they do. Absolutely. Just go to, you, you can either Google Deer Meat for Dinner. Uh, you can go to YouTube and put in deer meat for dinner. It, we have a fairly strong presence there. So if you Google deer meat for dinner, you're going to have a lot to choose from. And then once you're there, make your way to our channel where you can subscribe. It's free to subscribe. And all that does, that allows you to get notifications that oh, we've uploaded a new video. And then you can be a part of our channel. I tell everybody on the channel, hey, if you disagree with us, no sweat. I don't care if you disagree with us, but please be respectful. Um, and when people get on our channel, if we have a tiny group of people that may get vulgar, and all we do is we ban them. Um, we try to have a family-oriented, no cussing, um, good, wholesome channel that shows real life, hunting, fishing, diving, cooking, um, our dogs. And we love it. We consider every one of our subscribers friends, and we appreciate all of their, their support and encouragement. Because if it were not for them, we're just a married couple talking to a camera. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you, like your last video, grilling ribs and passing down the Winchester, your buddy there, um, man, you could see in his eyes when you when you gave him, his, his grandfather gave him that gun, passed it down to him, and it looked like it was, obviously it needed a bunch of uh, work and repair, and you, you got the parts uh, done for him. And the look in his eye when he saw what you had done, and then he put it together and he gave it then to his daughter, it was just awesome. Here's this tough, you know, your buddy, tough-looking guy, and you could just see it in his eyes how much it meant and how sincere he was and being able to hug his daughter and, and you know, give her that gun. That was just an incredible moment. That was, you know, doing what I do, I've had some really unique opportunities to meet. Can, do you have time for one story? Absolutely. Here's one cool story for you. That was amazing. I love Joey Haluska like a brother. I'd do anything for him. He would do anything for you. Joey would do anything for anybody. That's just what kind of guy he is. I was at, there was a video, um, I don't remember the exact name of it. It's salmon fishing, curing the row. It was me out salmon fishing in Seattle or um, north of Seattle uh, whenever I was out near Blaine. And so we go down to the river. I had never done it. It was the king salmon running up, I think, the Samish River. But we get down there, and I could see this one dude over near the bridge. His name's Guy, Guy Bannon. Man, he was wearing him out. And, I, you know, I caught my fair share, which no one expected me to. <clears throat> but the second day, I saw where that guy was fishing a hole next to the bridge. So I got down there, and I got in this hole. I caught a couple really big hens. And as he showed up, I moved out of the way. And I, I saw him notice that I moved out of his hole. I was just respecting there. And um, 
he started catching. I walked down and I said, um, sir, I said, would you mind if I just interviewed you a little bit on tape? I said, I'm doing a YouTube video. And he's like, yeah, when I'm done fishing, we'll talk. So I waited around. He got his two hens. It was done. Hens are the females. <clears throat> we sat down. We talked a little bit. I said, how long have you been fishing this river? He said, I've been fishing this river since the day you were allowed to. He goes, you see that sign over there? There was a sign stuck in the mud called George's Hole. He goes, that sign. He goes, me and my dad fished here together. His name's George. When he died, we put that sign here for him. He goes, this is our hole. I was like, well, I kind of figured it was your whole way of ripping fish out of it. And so we did it. We talked and talked and talked. And you could tell he was a little bitter. He wasn't real friendly. And so I left and I made that video. Well, I was, you know, it was a few months later. I'd uploaded the video. And I was on State Road 60 going alligator hunting on the North, on the uh, Kissimmee River, <clears throat> Pool A. And I'm stuck in a traffic jam. I get a phone call and I, I answer. I said, hello? He goes, uh, Robert Arrington? I said, yes, sir. He goes, this is Guy Bannon. He goes, uh, I did a video. I did a video, or I was on one of your videos, salmon fishing. I said, "Yes, sir." I said, "How you doing, man?" He just broke down. He goes, "I want you to know." He goes, "When my dad died, I was bitter at life. I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want to talk to you when you were there because I had no idea what you were doing. I don't even know why I did talk to you." He goes, "But when I just watched your video, he goes, there was a weight lifted off of my shoulders." He goes, "I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that because it means a lot to me." And I thought, you know what? That's special, and now I keep in touch with Guy a lot. Now Guy wants to become a guide because he is the best salmon fisherman out there. The guy's amazing. He wants to show other people how to catch those fish and how to enjoy those rivers. And I thought, you know what? What a special way to use YouTube, to use the ability to tell a story on the video. Hold on a second. What yeah. a special way to, to show people what life is all about. And then to realize, you know what? This made a difference in this man's life. He's not bitter anymore. He's not mad anymore. He's happy. And uh, that's that's one of my highlights of my YouTube career so far is, is that phone call and knowing that that video helped him. Awesome stuff, man. Awesome story. And uh, you're doing such a fantastic job. Encourage the listeners out there, uh, deer meat for dinner. Go find them. You'll love it. Um, I want you to uh, tell Sarah hello from me and uh, be looking for the, the news here in the next few days with your baby. And uh, God bless you guys. And I look forward to having you on again. And uh, just uh, thanks for all that you do and, and keeping it real. And, um, yeah, I'm excited for you guys to be parents and uh, get, to, get to see God's blessing in your life of, of having a baby girl. And it's going to be fantastic. So, until I talk to you next time, buddy, God bless, and I'll catch you later, okay? Thank you so much, Jay. It was a very pleasure talking to you. Have a nice night. All right. Okay. Cheers.